<laughs> you know, most of the characters that I know of are dead. <laughs> <laughs> so who could it be that's unexpected? Welcome to Podcasts Across Worlds, where we like to watch a lot of anime, read a lot of manga, and talk about it for hours. I'm your host, Wahila Superfina. And I'm Mikhail Casanova. Today in this pot episode, we are going to talk about To Your Eternity. We finally watched it in 2021. Anime premiered. And it is now 2023, and second season has come out. I've been reading the manga, too. <laughs> I saw the manga first, and I didn't really care for it. So when I saw it as an anime, I was like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to like this. And it turned out really good. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think when we first started watching it, we watched two or three episodes and it didn't really catch us oh didn't you say it was depressing well yeah well the first episode was really depressing because it it felt like they were just like completely like painting this as like a hopeless situation and then it went on to be i think yeah they did the time skip and it was a little girl march and that we didn't really know where it was going with it, uh-huh. and it was really slow, so we stopped watching it. And then, like, a year later, I picked it back up and started watching it. I was like, yo, this is really, really good. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, because we were, by the time it got to Marge, we were very turned off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we just saw this boy who was struggling to survive, who was trying to find other people who are living because he was alone with a dog for a really long time and he didn't make it and when he dies he's reunited with all the lost souls yeah and it looks like he made it but he didn't so it's like oh this is kind of depressing (laughs) (laughs) and then we see this little girl who's going to be sacrificed it's like okay i I'm kind of over it with kids dying on me. Yeah, yeah. Because at first, like, I thought it was going to be when they they had the girl march and mm-hmm. she's going to be sacrificed. I'm like, is this going to be like uh, Promise Neverland? Like, is it going to be? Because I wasn't sure like how dark this is going to go, and that which is the theming of the first season or the first couple chapters of the or first arc of uh to your eternity is it's really really dark it's kind of scary or not scary uh, crazy how dark it gets well initially we were watching this because mikhail was looking for what he said gut punching gut punch to the soul you're looking for something that will hit you in the soul. And you found out that it was to your eternity. Yeah, that one. It, I, I, You know, and that's the thing. is like I wasn't sure like how it was going to do the soul punches. Uh, should, should we jump into that? Or what, what's the flow of this conversation? How are we going to do it? You're leading it. <laughs> well, I wanted to give a little backstory of why we were actually watching it since I was kind of dismissive of it at first, and we were both turned off by how depressing it was. Then you heard it was so punching. Yeah, because yeah, I think I went on Reddit. I had to think about that for a second. I said, did I go on Reddit, or did I... <laughs> like, I went on something, and they were like, it's really, really soul-crushing. And I was like, what? Okay, let me go watch it. And I watched it and I was like, oh God. And I kept watching it. Like, I started binge watching it. And like, legit, I was like crying at every arc in the first (laughs) season. I was like, yo, this is like, if it kept going that route, I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to be done with this. (laughs) It's like playing Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core. And, like, getting to Zack's final stand, like, every couple chapters or couple episodes. I'm like, yeah, I, I can't. Like, I want my soul to be gutted, not, like, stepped on and pissed on. Like, that was too <laughs> much for me. All right, so let's explain what your eternity is about. 
Uh, it starts off with this orb and it is on a planet and whatever it touched it's on earth it mimics its its form mm -hmm. and it got to a point where this orb now is a dog and the dog encounters a human and that's where the story starts and this orb is just learning how to be whatever form they mimic so it had to learn how to be a dog, how to eat, what to eat. And then a human, then as a human, it learned that there was more limitations. It could die from cold, from starvation, exhaustion, et cetera, et cetera. And then this form just encounters more living creatures, more humans. And we just see its journey and man, you can't fall in love with a character. No, no. That, <laughs> that's the thing is like, do not get, like try not to spoil anything. But if you do watch this, like don't don't get attached at all. Because I mean, stay attached to Fushi, but like anyone else they introduce, just know that like yeah. The clock's ticking. Think like Game of Thrones. Every character you ever became attached with somehow dies off. <laughs> Game of Thrones, Walking Dead. Yeah, but it's it's yeah, it's roughly around there. Yeah. And so I didn't think I was going to get attached to these characters because I already knew that the premise was that our main character is immortal. So for eternity, they will live on. So I knew this main character, who is named Fushi, would outlive all these characters that he encounters. So I knew that, but I didn't know how deep their relationship would be. And Yeah, she's holding a controller, guys. <laughs> <laughs> for a reason. I was holding it for a reason. Anyways... You don't realize how deep the relationship is in sh such a short amount of time. And I thought it was going to be years, decades, that these relationships would solidify and deepen. No, it, they're quick. Fushi's really good at building these relationships. <laughs> and, and the show and the manga as well goes very well at, at the pace of showing how like time to him is nothing. Mm -hmm. Like we, I think one arc where it went the longest was when you got to the arc. The I guess the third arc when you got to Gugu, like that was the longest amount of time that passed that he was like with someone, and it was like even then that with, with I think that was kind of like the second longest arc of the second of the first season, and then as you're watching it mm -hmm. like. You like is Gugu gonna survive? Because they kind of played it off like he had multiple brushes with death. Yeah, and because of the past arcs, you're gonna think, yeah, this one's gonna die. Yep. Mm hmm. And then no, it turns out that he survives, and I guess because Gugu expressed that he wanted to live their lives together. This prompt Fushi, who's immortal, who doesn't have to age, let himself age. Yeah. Along with Gugu. And I totally thought Gugu was going to die. And so I had no expectations of what he was going to look like when he got older. And he was manly. Yeah, he, he, was, he was yoked. <laughs> <laughs> like, he, he was eating his Wheaties. And so you're thinking, yeah, he's going to live his his whole life. He's going to go through all the different stages, phases of his life. He's going to get married, have kids. Fushi's going to see him have kids. No, that didn't happen. And that was another punch kick to the soul. Okay, so I guess to give you guys a bit of a context, so like... Uh, so, the first season introduces you to 
four the four main characters uh, that interact with or leave an impression or stimulation on uh, Fushi. So the first one is an unnamed boy who ends up becoming the default form of Fushi. That character, I mean, it's not really a spoiler. The unnamed boy dies, but Fushi ends up getting the form of his dog and him. And then from there, there's a couple decades Mm -hmm. that skip from him walking as the boy constantly dying and reviving before he gets to March. The anime doesn't showcase that. Mm -hmm. With the manga, it's a couple decades. So he gets there, and then he um, gets to March. She's supposed to be... I kind of want to say like her village is kind of like a hybrid between like Native American and, and Kanto or, or uh, Ryukyu Japanese. But it was kind of like a mer- mixture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, in her village, which, see, I forget the name of the village, but I, I'll figure it out later. But in her village, um, they do a sacrifice for, I forgot the god. Some some bear god yeah, that they like worship. Onikuma. Onikuma, yeah. So they they um they do sacrifice the child sacrifices and March is next up. And March is a girl that's very vivid, very animated. She's like four or five years old. Um she wants to grow up and be a mama, have kids, and then there's the other girl who's also introduced in that arc oh, I forget her name. What is her name? Her name is Perona. So you introduce to March and Perona. He ends up getting March's form because March does die. And then there's, uh, you're introduced to the first main villain, Hayashi. Uh huh. And uh, you're thinking, okay, he's going to be smart enough to kill her. He he does maim her. And then, like, it, it, Shows her going back to the village and to her getting shot by uh, Perona. Uh-huh. And then you see her smile. You see Perona's face. And then you don't see anything else because he leaves and goes somewhere else. Right, right. And then you get to him meeting Gugu. But also he meets um, Pierrot, Pierrot, which is the old lady. Yeah, the old lady that was introduced during March's arc. Right. So I'm, I'm going to stop going into detail and stuff there because you come to see how things, everything, every person and every situation you're introduced to, they're all connected. Right, right. So it's like six degrees of separation, except he's the connecting thing, but s- certain arcs and characters will overlap, but still don't get attached to anyone. And it's kind of hard... Because, so, what Mika explained was Fushi gains the forms of people who, I guess, create stimulation for him. Like, he has that deep connection. Mm -hmm. I guess just the thought of them stimulates him and he changes, he's able to change into their form. So, you get attached to a character they die. You're like, oh no, they died. And Fushi changes into their forms because their death is so deep for him. And so you're just reminded by how severe these deaths were. Yeah, and they, and they go out to show the person who's attached to Fushi, with them dying, they die a painful way. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it goes from the first character, the unnamed boy, dying of an infection. Mm-hmm. And he was slowly, painfully dying. Yeah. The dog died of uh, hypothermia, uh, frostbite. Yes. And um, then March dies by taking an arrow for Perona. And then... Do we want to say I run it? We just leave it. It, it just leave gets that. worse. It leave gets worse. That. Like every death gets worse. Um, and then yeah. <laughs> later on, 
he can change into their forms even when he's not aware of their death. Like one day, he just feels an, a sensation and he checks to see if he can change into their form. And when he sees their reflection, it's confirmation. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> Another one, and I can change into them just to remind myself that they're forever dead. Or are they? No, I think everyone that he's he's changed into, they're all dead. Well, so the story of To Your Eternity isn't just about him being able to change forms of people who he had a connection with. It turns out there's like a higher being. There is someone who created Fushi. And he has plans. And he's able to connect souls. And bodies. And we don't know what's going on. We don't know if these people will stay dead. And they're teasing it. Still teasing it. Well, yeah, so, like, where we're at, when they first introduced the Observer, a.k.a. Black Thing, um, they introduced him within, I want to say, the third arc. Yeah, because they just showed him in the first arc, but they don't really introduce, like, oh, there's an actual person. And that's one of the things the show does. It does a lot of show, don't tell. Like, he'll introduce something to you, and then as soon as you see it and you start to question it, it then it's gone. <laughs> and it's like, it'll pop back up, but in a way you don't expect. But yeah, mm-hmm. so the the higher being, uh, the observer, you then come to find out as episodes go on, he's not the only one of his kind. And the whole thing is, he narrates the opening of every episode. And you start to notice when he narrates within an episode of talking to Fushi or to himself, it's an experiment or like some type of like he's he's taking progress notes of what's going on. It's totally an observation, a.k.a. why he's called Observer. (laughs) So at first, you're just seeing him kind of instructing Fushi what to do and explaining why Fushi is able to do what he does, which is transforming, replicating, and such. So you're thinking that Fushi is just a test subject. Yeah. And then there's these... Sorry, enemies, oh, the knockers. The knockers. Uh, the antagonists, which are called knockers. And the Observer says they're trying to sabotage our plans. So we all assume they're enemies, but we don't know why they're enemies. We don't know why the Knockers wants to hinder the Observer's plans, experiments. And then it gets really deep where it's about life and what is and what is not supposed to happen. And it's sort of like it depends on the circumstances and perspective, but we don't know what's going on. <laughs> no. No. And so the knockers, they look like basically moving, they look like brains with branch arms that yeah, can extend. They look like, okay, they remind me of plants that had nodes. So when a plant has like a little bud or branch that's about to come out it's like a called a node Mm -hmm. it makes me think of like those nodes that somehow were able to like snap off and grow their own roots and they're they look like parasites so it creeps me out and then they they also uh function like parasites so like they will um they'll possess the body all they have to do is like i think attach to you and then in, like get inside of you and it seems like the minute that they go in you they kill you so and then they pos- and and so like by the time you get to like the fourth arc um then you've got kind of like a evil dead type of situation uh, it's like really creepy because when we first see these knockers they're pretty primitive instinctive they would utilizes 
utilize the elements or sources they have on hand, which was the earth, the trees, whatever they touched. But as they fight with Fushi more, as Fushi evolves, so do they. And I'm just wondering, when will it be to a point where they're all sentient, I want to say? Like, they can think for their own, make their own choices, because they sound kind of robotic. Like, they're working as the way they're programmed to. There is one knocker that does have a form of sentience, but we don't want to talk about that because that's a bit of a spoiler. Yeah, that's a spoiler. And the antagonist that they are uh, in cahoots with is... That was a left field. Yeah, so that's also a spoiler. So the <laughs> we're, like of, <laughs> we're tiptoeing around it. The, the reason why I brought these things up is because I'm showing, I'm trying to show that this story really built up to settings that I was not expecting. Like, I wasn't expecting there was higher beings fighting. <laughs> I thought this is just... A being was created, put on this planet to learn how to live and observe the humankind through this test subject. No, it turns out there's like a battle of souls. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a term for that too, don't they? Yeah, um, I think it was called like Phi. Yeah, Phi. Phi. That's what it's called. And it kind of reminded me of one of those um, Tales of Tales games. Where everybody's made out of like this molecular molecule, and we are made of that, and it's being used for power and whatnot. Anyways, it just reminded me of Tails games. <laughs> but besides that, so there's like a scientific explanation to life, souls, spirits. Where do they go? But they're kind of cryptic with that explanation. And it kind of made me think, so is this planet an experiment? <laughs> are they real? Or are they artificial? It, it, see, and I don't really know the answer to that. I know the manga, they're in modern times of now. Oh, yeah. And Fushi is a student. Uh, but, like, it, it really does, uh, it makes you wonder, like, what is going on? Where are they? You know, like, is this, like, the Observer and the Knockers just came to Earth or our existence to do an experiment? Because it seems like it's a rival experiment. Okay. That that's the way like I I've interpreted it. it it's it really comes off that way. It comes off like they're like okay, let's let's put our bets in. After so many millennia, this will happen, or this will happen. We'll introduce this variable of this because when they introduce the knockers in arc, well, yeah, uh, arc three with Gugu. You only think there's like one, yeah, or two, and then that goes on to be far, far, far more. It's. I'm trying to like think how do they multiply because they kind of remind me of cells. Like there's there's something, a mass live being that is. Multiply, reproducing all these knockers. Where is it? Why is it there? How does it know that it needs to make more knockers? Yeah, because they're, they're very much like a hive mind. Yeah. So, what I really like about this story is it sort of feels like a mixture of sci fi and fantasy. Like, the way it gets presented, it seems very fantastical. But then the observer comes in and starts to explain it in a scientific way. And then you get characters are genuinely 
Fantastico, which is Bond, who sees spirits. Yeah, he he really introduces a variable of what is going on. I think before we dive into that, let's let's talk about the tone and the opening. Like for season one and season two. So the opening has a song is done by Yutaro Hikaru. And it sounds very Kingdom Hardish, which is mm-hmm. her. Like you, you hear her. He's like, oh yeah, it's Utada. Like that's her style, and it's very somber, like sad somber. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look at the opening. So if you you just start watching to your eternity, you you look at the opening for season one, you will have no idea what's going on, but the opening tells you everything about that that season yeah but it does it so fast it's it literally showcases multiple scenes very quickly and you have no idea what's going on you're like oh my gosh are these flashes of memories of thousands of years and it's crazy you'll start crying (laughs) after every arc yeah because all these scenes after you actually experience an arc you will recognize them as they flash very quickly you're yeah. going to be like oh, i remember that thing no and the more arcs you go through the more that intro hits you in the field it does. <laughs> and then so that goes into like the tone of season one and the tone of season two are very radically different. By um, tone, what do you mean? Like the atmosphere of it, like tone of it, like it's serious and and there's a sense of foreboding, oh, yeah. and, and like, and, and it's really because you're in a perspective of Fushi. I would say when it comes to the tone, because he doesn't really know anything, and he's learning, gaining new experiences, and it's like a very trial and error. You get to a certain arc, this you get attached, these people die. And it's heartbreaking. Like that's I would say the tone is very dark, melodic, and, and heartbreaking. Then you get to season two, and it's entirely different. The tone is not the same at all. But it's setting up, I feel, to be a bigger soul punch. Because it, I feel like it's subverting your expectation. Because the first arc of season two wraps up a, a, a thread from season one. Cliffing. That's true. That's true. So I think we talked about this before. And as we're talking for this episode of Podcast Across Worlds, we keep seeing saying Soul Punch. So the first season, I feel like we were getting soul punches. The second season, I feel like we're getting hit by a machine gun. We're we're getting like bullet soul hits. (laughs) Our soul is getting hit by a barrage of bullets. And they're not as big, but as they build up, it's like much bigger impacts and all those punches what i'm trying to say is we get hit a lot (laughs) we meet these people we didn't get the attached but then once we find out find out that they're dead we're like what (laughs) they were part of our group our posse and it's delayed because you get more time with these characters in season two than you did in season one and there are two people that have been with fushi for a very long time i'm just waiting for them to die i don't know how they're gonna die but i know they will and i'm like oh my god how badly will this hurt my soul i will say though like my favorite character Across both seasons that we've watched so mm-hmm. far. I want to say it's Bon. Bon Chin. Which is one of the characters that's been with Fushi for a very long time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if he dies. If he dies, like, I got attached to him and his significant others. 
Which even his arc, too, is very... Because they introduced... Okay, so if you look at the intro for season two, you would think he's a villain. A tacky-looking villain. Like, oh my gosh, it made me think of late 70s, early 80s villains. Like, no. I completely got... um, What's the name? The the main character for... A main singer of uh, Queen... Oh, I completely got vibes with him off of him because the way <laughs> they introduce Bond, he's very flamboyant to the point you would assume he's gay. Yeah, like you, re- they go all in with it, and then when a certain thing happens, they drop that completely, mm-hmm. and he's normal. And I know that caused a lot of controversy, but it's like he's such a dynamic character, right? And he grows. I think that's the other thing too is like you get that time with him and then he grows and matures and you're just like, okay, when is it going to happen? Yeah. You're just waiting for him to die. <laughs> you're, it's There's like that sense of anticipation and suspense. I don't want him to die. Like, I'm not anticipating it. I'm just like, <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah, it's it's super inevitable. Like, and, and that's just the thing is like this always happens with every arc you get in. Like, okay, how long do I have with this character? What's gonna happen? You know, what is Fushi gonna go through? And that's one of the things I will say that you get attached to Fushi in the first season. You start sympathizing with him because he's like a newborn deer. <laughs> yeah, but then because of him being not human and not mortal. He gets to become very annoying. He becomes very Aryan in situations where it's like, dude, just listen to Oh, you're talking others. about... So, when he's fighting with the knockers, every time when they hit him in a form, they steal that form away from him. And so he can't use it anymore. And what makes it worse is he doesn't even remember that form, that soul. And so he has like that sense of loss but he doesn't know what it is and like you see him being very reckless and it starts to become very annoying but then uh you like as a observer or or watcher you're gonna start calling him out for the stupid things that he does Mm -hmm. but then bond becomes the character that does that for us yeah, so for example, because Fushi is has that mentality of, I'm immortal, I can take hits, and Bond says, well, if you take hits, you lose that form, and you lose more skills, and you have less of a chance of winning against a knocker, so try not to get hit. <laughs> Learn to defend and fight. <laughs> and that's where Fushi kind of argues back, he's like, but... Why should I? It's like, oh, he just explained it to you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really is annoying with how Fushi starts acting very childish very frequently. Mm-hmm. And it's like, dude, grow up already. Like, I mean, not to be like a downer. It's just he gets really in his own way. Yeah, I guess you could say this is his adolescent phase because Season one was like, okay, he's like a newborn, a toddler. He's learning. He's still learning. He doesn't know better. And by season two, he should know better. Mm. He's lived for a lot more decades. (laughs) He's met more people. He's experienced a lot of stuff. He's been talking with the Observer for years, you know. So he should know better. He's constantly trying to run away from his responsibility. And that becomes annoying. And um, you can kind of tell he's been an adolescent because there's a lot of brash decisions. Like, he kind of goes by emotion a lot, which is interesting because that's where his powers come about, is that sense of stimulation. Yeah. I would definitely say... um, I I can't talk about that character because that's a spoiler. (laughs) Um, the characters, I will say, are very well written. They are. 
AR. You know. Which is surprising because you would think that all the focus would be on Fushi, the main character, but it doesn't. And one of the things I'm kind of curious is, about, well, curious about is where is the story going to go? Like, yeah, where? Yeah, because Fushi can now replicate things, objects, water, can you? continents. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, okay. Are you going to try to create another planet? <laughs> well, that's one of the things this tease is like the observer tells him he needs to learn how to do this so he can replicate or revive or whatever the world. Whatever high plan the observer has, he's trying to get Fushi to be able to accomplish those plans. And it's it teases that. But we're still focusing on the characters that this story built up for us. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's 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 really well done. Like I, I I would say like regardless of whether you choose to read it or if you choose to watch it, um, you're gonna enjoy it either way. And it's one of the instances and I, I feel like a lot of anime is starting to get this to this point where the anime to the manga is almost one to one. Yeah. You know, like I, I know this is probably like a whole separate conversation, but I've been noticing that with a lot of uh manga and anime that we watch. Uh for the most part, the anime adaptations are usually one to one, like Tomo Chan, minus them kind of taking a few liberties here and there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um it's still relatively the same story. Um, which makes it so hard to go back and watch anime from like the 2010s, 2000s, oh, yeah, 90s, 80s because trying to keep up with the manga and then they ended up surpassing the manga and then they put in fillers, yeah, or you get the villain of the week type of situations, yeah, or they took liberties and shortened the story, taking out arcs. And yeah. it's like, why? C- case in point, uh, people who love Trigun and hate the new Trigun anime and don't realize that the Trigun anime that we all grew up with is in no way accurate to the manga whatsoever. I would say the Trigun anime is like, Five or ten percent. It's actually like five percent okay. of the of the original manga because the original anime for Trigun came out in ninety eight, and the manga came out in ninety six and ran till two thousand eight. So, you know they they went a whole different route. You're thinking his powers within his gun mm-hmm. and being a plant, mm-hmm. and then when you read the manga, you come to find out the gun was never even made by knives and vash and knives they're degrading so you're saying that we're going to have another paw episode about trigon, trigon yes <laughs> yes we are yeah we are and the point of bringing that up is because to your eternity is pretty much one for one. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It doesn't really deviate. You may get like a little more information as far as like the narration from the observer because he's a little bit more present oh. in um, the manga to explain like the shifts and time skips and stuff like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, beyond that, yeah, the, the the anime is pretty faithful to it. So yeah, it, it's it's not like the situation with like Promise Neverland, uh, Neverland, where that season two went a whole different direction. But you know, I still enjoyed, <laughs> I still enjoyed that anime, which is something you know, like all these anime outlets, they were all like, how god awful. <laughs> you saw it, like it was such outrage, and like we watched it, like yo, this is go, this, this is good. I was like, yo, I, I'm enjoying it. Then I read it, I was like, oh god, this is really good. <laughs> but like, I'm I'm someone who can appreciate the deviation because you okay. I know this is probably going to be a Paul episode too, mm-hmm. but Promise Neverland. I understand why they went a different route because like you had read, I don't think you read all of it. You read most of it. 
I read most of it. And like when we were watching the anime, you're like, okay, that's different. That's different. Because season one is fully accurate. Yeah. Season two is where it deviates after a couple of episodes. Yeah. But if you read the manga, you would realize they're, they cannot replicate that. Because of the kids dying in such gruesome ways, they're not. Mm -mm, mm. That wouldn't go in Japan. Yeah, that was. It's also because the timing of the premiere. Because in the U.S., there were shootings going on, and then there's that political subject that was going on about guns. Guns. Can you possess guns? How easy? How difficult should it be to acquire a gun, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So it's like And the kids use guns and that all throughout. So yeah, that yeah. it wouldn't have flown. Uh, yeah. No, 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 no. I don't even think they use guns in the second season. I think they cuz they changed a lot of stuff. Um And the ending is different, too. Yeah, so there's a lot of liberties made for Promised Neverland. But, as you said, it was still good. And we, under- and we understand why. So, that's okay. When, when they take, would you say liberties? <laughs> when they make adjustments due to external factors that's fine yeah but when they take liberties because that's what they wanted mm-mm, they ain't that ain't gonna fly no <laughs> yes yeah, it's, it's not and you know and it's it's a case-by-case thing certain things you know they can't fully adapt like we were uh, we found out about a new manga the shiori experience and oh, yeah. like there's no way that's going to be adapted because of the legal licensing issues of dmca Music yeah, industry, like because the theme of that manga was music and real music in our world, and that whole copyright issue for the anime. <laughs> yeah, they're they're not gonna deal with that. But yeah, I know we we kind of <laughs> or I, mean, I deviate. Well, I mean, like for example, uh, was it uh, Guardians of the Galaxy when they play all those songs? We were thinking. Oh, how much did they have to pay for the rights to play that for the movie? And then you start thinking, like, are they going to continue paying for that license for it down, you know, a couple years from now, decades from now? Or are they going to, when they re-release it, because they always re-release stuff, are they going to change the music to something else? Yeah, yeah. So that's the one you, So that's why we brought up um, different titles of manga and such because we were thinking about the variations adaptations to anime and why things are different why some manga doesn't even have a anime adaptation the other thing too i was I've been thinking about when it comes to to your eternity is it doesn't seem like it's mainstream you would think it is and the seasons are long yeah unexpectedly so yeah so typically uh, anime structure, the old anime structure used to be 24 episodes. Yes. And if it did really well, they would get be, another season. You get another season. But anime back in the day was mainly to push toys. Yeah. That, that was the main purpose of it. Whereas like now, it's, that's not the case whatsoever. Um, With this one, it's like, with anime now, it's 12 episodes. For a season. On this, average. Uh, yeah, on average. Season one for this is 20 episodes. Season two is going to be 20 episodes. And it's not mainstream because the only thing I hear as far as mainstream anime talked about is Attack on Titan, My Hero Academia, Spy Family, and uh, what else is there? Naruto, it, I get Baruto. Baruto. <laughs> and um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, the Blood War one. The what? Uh, with Ichigo. Oh. Bleach. Yeah. Blood War. Or a thousand, or whatever it is. Um, that That's mainly the mainstream stuff you hear about. You don't really, I don't, aside from A.H. Brandon reviews, like I don't hear anyone talk about To Your Eternity. It's almost like that really has gone under the radar. Hmm, I'm not surprised because one, the cover, 
you just see a kid that looks like he's going traveling. So that one people could probably just write off as, oh, this is a slice of life of someone during in like whatever time period it is. And then the title, To Your Eternity, that sounds really deep, yo. To Your Eternity, what does that mean? Is it going to be philosophical? Is it going to be <laughs> a slice of life? What is the story going to be about with that title? Yeah. So I could see that. And then when they actually like read the first two chapters, it literally looks like a play-by-play of someone trying to live or survive in this snowy ice area. Yeah. So it's like it it's very has a very bad or not very well good first impression. <laughs> yeah. It's it, and that's something you guys should to take into account. The first three episodes are very slow. Yeah. They're very slow. But if you can weather through that, it picks up very quickly. And it gets a lot better. And I want to say the pacing of the anime in comparison to the manga in the first the first three episodes of the first uh, five to six chapters, they're paced very differently. The manga is, it has a better flow to it than the anime. Hmm. But um, it, the problem is, I, I think, trying to showcase the the flow of time. Yeah, it really looks like not much time has passed. Even when you see uh, actual people aging and such, it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. It's weird. (laughs) Yeah. Like, it, you just all of a sudden see people like, oh, you're older. Wow. Dang. What happened? Because I couldn't tell. (laughs) And the anime doesn't really make it a point to to tell you how much time has passed. Like, here's a very good example. Fushi's on an island. He's all alone on that island. It's just life. Like, plant life there, animal life there, nothing else, no development. And we're just told, oh, 40 years pass. It's like... You can't tell. I can only take your word for it. I thought it was trippy, too. Like, in that 40 years, like, he spent, like, three years as, like, a crab or something. Yeah. He said he, for (laughs) years, he was in the sea as a crab, as different. (laughs) And 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 he he can't eat fish or seafood anymore because of it. Yeah, because he made friends with the marine life. So anyways, the only real indication that time passed is when we saw two characters that aged. And then we hear that another character had, like, a grandchild. So it's like, okay, that's kind of weird, but sure. You just move on with life. So, And there's also a, a love subplot. We're not going to talk about that, but... I told you that I was going to take you by surprise. Yeah, you did. You told me that this character... So I was asking, so does he get a love interest? It's like, yeah, Fushi does, but it's totally someone unexpected. I'm like, what do you mean? Unexpected. Because, <laughs> you know, most of the characters that I know of are dead. <laughs> so who could it be that's unexpected? And then, boom. Like, did they come back to life? Like, what? <laughs> yeah. So, like, and then you find out, like, that person's like, oh, I've loved you since I first met you. And it's like, what? Yeah. But anyways, there's a lot of dynamics in this story. Not everybody is his friend. <laughs> no. So where do you want to go from here? I think I've talked about everything I wanted to talk about of two year eternity. Yeah. I think we just got to probably come back to this when the season ends. Oh, yeah. Because it's only on season two, episode 15, I believe. Yeah. So we got like five more weeks. Yeah. We're definitely going to touch on this again. Yeah. So that's that's uh, to your eternity. It's something uh, if you haven't read it or if you haven't watched it, definitely check it out. Uh, highly rated from us. Uh, yeah. 
So if you guys have heard of it, watched it, read it, let us know your thoughts on it too. It can be positive, negative, whatever. Just let us know on your thoughts. And if you also want to interact with us on social media across the boards you can find me at lehua superfina i also have a youtube channel you can search lehua superfina and you can see videos i upload about anime manga and video games and other things that i'm interested in yeah and you can find me i'm mikhail casanova across the board just look that up on everything tiktok instagram facebook yeah, I don't know why I said Facebook, but I have Facebook, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. So, yeah, definitely check me out over there. Keep reading manga, keep watching anime, and keep listening to podcasts across worlds. We'll see you on the next one.